Well, welcome to Ridgecrest this morning. Good morning, church. Well, it's good to see you all. What a great day to be in this house and worship together, especially to our guests for the first time or possibly for the first time, maybe in a long time, if you're guests of ours today, we welcome you. And if you would, do us a favor. Fill out this little tab you'll find on the back of your worship floor this morning, morning and give that back to us. We'd love to know who you are. And uh, better yet, you can give that to us in the offering part of our worship service, or you can go to our welcome centers. Out that door, look to your left. Go out in the main hallway and look to your right. We have a gift bag for you with some information about us as a church family. We'd love to meet you there. We have some volunteers waiting for you. And I'll tell you what, we may have an escort for you to a connection group afterwards as well. We'd love to have you in our small groups, and uh, that's, we, that's the bread and butter of our church ministry here at Ridgecrest. We'd love to see you there after services. Come by and visit us there. And now let's pray together now, continue worship, and after that, Brother Tim, you'll lead us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for calling us here this morning. God, I thank you for the opportunity that we can offer you our heart, soul, mind, and strength this morning. Father, so the name of Jesus will be glorified and lifted higher than anything else. I pray, God, you give us the desire to desire you with everything we have that you would empty our minds from distractions and ready our minds for your word, open our hearts, and make our lives available to endeavor to be a disciple of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for what you're going to do and how we can worship you in this moment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Tim? Let's stand together and welcome each other. Shout out prayer. 
great song uh, to gather in this place and to begin our fellowship and worship together. And I'm delighted this morning to introduce someone to you who's going to introduce some other folks to you. This past fall, uh, our church voted to embark on a campaign to, I believe, tackle uh, something that's going to help us become the church that God has created and designed us to be, and that is to tackle the debt. You know, we've got a great staff, we've got a great church, a great campus, we've got a great congregation, and I think the one thing left now for us to tackle is the debt. And uh, because of that, we began praying about this uh, really uh, almost two years ago. And uh, in the fall, we uh, contacted a Christian organization that helps us do those very things. And I'm, uh, I'm particularly excited about what's coming in the days ahead because I believe it's going to enable us to do a couple of things. Uh, number one, it's going to enable us to do ministry on a level that we have never done ministry before in Ridgecrest. As we get free of any encumbrance that would keep us from doing and being and becoming everything God wants us to be. And number two, you know, these are interesting days in our culture, in our nation. You, if you've read my column, you uh, would uh, see what I mean by that. And because of that, I think it's all the more important that we become a church that is agile, that has no encumbrances, so we can do uh, whatever we need to do in the years ahead. And so that's why I'm excited about what you'll be hearing more and more about, the Freedom Campaign. When I began to pray about who should chair uh, this important uh, campaign, God put on my heart a man that many of you know, uh, Robert Johnson. And I want Robert uh, to come and share just a word with you. And Robert's going to share uh, not only some personal thoughts about uh, where we're headed with this freedom campaign and his own life, but he's also going to introduce to you our leadership team and a number of people that are already behind the scenes praying and working and serving in this uh, important uh, uh, spiritual emphasis. So Robert, would you come and share with us? Ridgecrest family, uh, in the days ahead, you're going to be hearing a lot uh, about freedom. You're going to be hearing a lot about uh, the freedom campaign. But I want to start off by telling you a little bit about uh, really what freedom means to me. And uh, uh, I came to Ridgecrest over 30 years ago in the, uh, in the late 80s. And uh, uh, I mean, I was not a Christian. I did not know the Lord uh, when I came to Ridgecrest, and where I'm standing right now was a, was a parking lot, and uh, just over here to this side was a, a playground for kids, and little did I know that uh, in less than a year that this faith family would lead me to the Lord, and uh, it, was a, it was a college career age Sunday school class. Melanie, you were part of that group, and Richard Talley, and so many others that uh, that are here and maybe gone off to other places, but uh, they had a zeal for life. And it was their moms and their dads that uh, would invite me uh, to eat uh, lunch and dinner at their tables, and soon uh, they became my moms and my dads. And uh, within a year, at a Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting in 1988, uh, in a small sanctuary on the other side of this church, uh, I ran up the aisle and grabbed a hold of, uh, of God. And uh, as a young boy, I was shackled by the devil in this world, and I accepted Jesus' sacrifice for death of my sins, and I received my freedom. That's what freedom means to me. And uh, beyond salvation, uh, Ridgecrest discipled. I look out across this uh, church, this congregation, and I see so many people uh, that love me, just like I was their own. And... Uh, that means the world to me. And, and I even think about others that, uh, that are no longer with us, uh, uh, that uh, were faithful uh, to do and act on what the Lord uh, asked of them. Uh, names come to mind like Scooter Norris, uh, uh, Gwen Ferguson, uh, Mary Ruth Morrison, uh, Joe Crozier, uh, Charles Olive, so many that, uh, that poured into my life, so many others that I can't even imagine, can't even begin to name. And... Uh, you know, when I think about those and I think about this legacy, uh, I think about the love that they shared uh, that drew me to become thirsty for Christ. And uh, uh, my mom passed away just uh, two years ago, and I think about uh, 
something that came to me shortly after that, and I think about the legacy of these, and I, and I remember that, uh, that we're, all, we're all just here for a little while. Uh, it's our turn now. That's what I feel, and that's really what this uh, freedom campaign means to me, and that's why I'm excited about this campaign. Whether you know it or not, he's already been working behind the scenes, preparing you, preparing all of us uh, to be what he needs us to be in the days and the years ahead, to reach other lost souls just like me, just like you. That's what he's been doing. And today, more than ever before in our lifetime, as Brother Ray was, uh, was mentioning, uh, the world needs us. The world needs a church like Ridgecrest Baptist Church, and I'm proud to, to be a part of this family. The time has come for Ridgecrest to become free of anything that's going to hold us back. And that's why the Freedom Campaign, that's what this campaign is about. Many uh, are already involved in this uh, campaign uh, to uh, become free of debt, and uh, many others are going to be asked to get involved in the days ahead. So uh, uh, imagine, you know, just imagine what could happen in this church to sow, to grow, and to go in the days ahead. And uh, uh, I'd like to ask our entire church family to, to begin now uh, to pray uh, for those that are involved and those that will be involved, and then also pray for your part in what God is going to be doing. So, Brother Ray, if you'd allow me, I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce uh, our team. I would uh, I, I try to stay in front of this mic, but, uh, but first I'm going to introduce our team leaders. Uh, Danny Mallory, if you would stand up. And then also uh, David Brunson, uh, Mark Hall, if you'd stand up also. And then uh, our program, these are our team leaders. And then our program manager is Melanie Miles, if you would stand up as well. So uh, this is our leadership team. And there's also many others that uh, are already involved. Uh, if you've been asked, I'm going to ask you, if you've been asked to uh, be involved in any of our free Freedom Campaign committees or teams, I'd like you to stand up as well, if you would. Uh, there's many already in this church that are involved, so you can see that uh, God is already at work. He's already doing a, an amazing thing. So remember, I'm going to ask each and every one of you in our, in our family to pray. Uh, pray for this team. Pray that God leads our church towards freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Ray. I'm going to ask you, those that uh, Robert just recognized, would you, would you stand back up? I want us to pray for these folks because of their leadership roles in this campaign. And uh, through a variety of other uh, uh, contacts, uh, many of you will be uh, contacted. And here, let me go ahead and tell you what to say when you're contacted. When they contact you, say, Yes. All right. But I believe this is a great next step for our church. I'm excited about what it's going to do for us in, in the future. Keep your antenna up. We'll officially launch the campaign at the end of this month. But we wanted you to go ahead and be praying about these people and praying for them because of their specific leadership responsibilities. Now, look around this room. There's some in the balcony and the choir around, around you. Would you pick out a couple of faces right now? And could, because I want to ask us all to stand with them, and I want to lead us in a prayer uh, for them. Now, Father, we thank you for the great privilege of being a partner with you, not because you need us, but because you give us the opportunity to be engaged in the kingdom work. I thank you for these who have stood, Father, who have already said yes to helping Ridgecrest do, Father, what we believe you're calling us to do, and that is to become unencumbered, Father, so that we can do more ministry, do more missions, so that we can listen to your voice in ways that we've perhaps never even heard it, to be all that you've created us to be. Would you give these our leaders? Would you give them great wisdom? Would you give them favor with people? And Father, would you bless this campaign for your great name's sake and for your glory? For we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to remember.
remain standing and join us together as we begin our time of worshiping choruses. We start with Holy Spirit rain down. Father, you're so good to us, so faithful. Lord, I'm reminded of Abraham and how he called you Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. And Father, as we give in obedience to you, Lord, I pray that you would bless us. Lord, I pray that these tithes and offerings would go and spread the gospel, Lord. We love you and we thank you. It's in your son Christ's name we pray. Amen.
you will, take your Bible this morning and open up to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 27, and we'll read our text here in just a moment. Oswald Chambers said this, faith for my deliverance is not faith in God. Faith means whether I am visibly delivered or not, I will stick to my belief that God is love. There are some things only learned in a fiery furnace. This morning what I want to talk with you about is conflict. But not conflict as in fighting and in wars. I mean conflict in the sense of when you're facing difficulties or struggles or trials, things, you know, that rock or challenge your faith and everything that you believe. In 1799, uh, Conrad Reed uh, was fishing in a little creek called uh, Little Meadow Creek, and he, uh, he found a 17-pound rock, and uh, it was a little intriguing to him. He kept it, he took it home, and for three years his family used it uh, as a doorstop. That is, until 1802 when his father decided to take the unusual-looking rock uh, to a jeweler who identified it as a lump of gold. In fact, it was worth thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars. And uh, the family used it as a doorstop for three years in North Carolina. And uh, it is to this day considered one of the largest gold nuggets ever found east of the Rockies. But you see, until the composition of that rock was determined, its value was unknown. And frankly, if it weren't used for what it was designed, it was worthless. And the same is true for us. Until the composition of our faith is determined, its strength is unknown. So you know what God does? God allows difficulties into our life. He allows seasons of trials and conflicts. And they're not designed to hurt us. They are designed to strengthen and to prove us and to reveal the real value of our faith. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all time, on the wall in his bedroom had a plaque with Isaiah 48.10 on it. This is what it says, I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. You know, God's choice makes chosen people choice people. And we are shaped not in the palace, but we're shaped in the furnace. And so with that in mind, and if you're physically able to do so, I invite you to stand with me this morning As we read our passage, Psalms chapter 27, verse 1 through 6. Follow along with me if you will. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When uh, evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear, though war rise against me. Yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For He will hide me in His shelter in the day of trouble." He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Would you bow your head with me as I lead us in prayer with heads bowed and eyes closed? May I get very personal with you this morning and ask, no one looking about in this place, how many of you right now feel like you're in a conflict, you're in a season of storm, you're in a trial, you're in some struggle? Would you just raise your hand? I want to pray specifically for you. Just raise your hand for just a moment all over this place. Hands all over. All over. All right, thank you. You can put them down. I want to pray. Father, you've seen every hand, and there are lots of them, Father, in this place today. And they're facing some conflict, some season of turmoil, of chaos, perhaps, some trial of various kinds, as James talks about. And Lord, I pray that their faith would not be rocked. 
I pray, Father, that like David in this psalm, they would learn the great truths of how to navigate through this season. I pray, Father, that you will uh, refresh them this morning with the promises of your word. And Father, give them solid footing upon the ground that they feel right now may be shaky. And Father, I pray that you will bring great glory to your name through their conflict, but that you would also show yourself strong in their hearts as they navigate these times. Speak now to us from your word. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. This is a Psalm of David, and uh, it was penned during a time of great conflict and distress. We don't know what had provoked this season of difficulty that David is facing, but he did indicate, if you read the entire chapter, that uh, it was a time when his enemies were trying to destroy him. If you read on, you see that his family had forsaken him, and his foes were spreading lies about him. Several ancient translations of the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, along with the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the, the Hebrew Old Testament translated into the Greek and was commonly what was used in the New Testament. And if you read some of these uh, ancient uh, translations in the Septuagint, they will often state uh, in the, the, the forward of this uh, a psalm, right before you start reading it, they will often state that, uh, that it was a psalm written before David was anointed king of Israel. And if this is accurate, then uh, it indicates that David authored this, Saul, uh, this uh, psalm probably when Saul was chasing him, trying to take his life, or perhaps some would argue with Absalom, but that was after he had been anointed. Whatever its original setting, Psalm 27 is one of the most loved of all the psalms. I went back in my sermon log and I found that I have preached on this psalm uh, five times in the last uh, 40 years. But it's always rich and every time I study it I come away with new truth. It is a beautiful psalm and it is for many the favorite of all of their psalms. And in it what God does is God's Holy Spirit teaches us through the hand and the heart of David, what to do when we too are in a season of conflict and difficulty. And with that in mind this morning, what I want to do is I want to show you three things that enabled David to have victory through the difficult season. You know, we often pray, God, take us out of the season, and sometimes God will take us out of the season. But do you know, the pattern of Scripture is generally that God takes his people through the season, not out of the season. And so with that in mind, I want to show you three ways David got through this season of conflict. And one of the reasons we love the Psalms is because David is such an honest man, isn't he, in the Psalms? And because we identify with so much of what we read there. And the first thing I want you to notice about David is that David had a conquered fear. You notice how he starts this thing off of, Whom shall I fear? The Lord's my light. The Lord's my salvation. He's my strong. Whom shall I be afraid of? Whom shall I fear? Seasons of conflict in our life are almost always characterized by fear, aren't they? I read this past week about a man who had become an Uber driver. Do you all know what an Uber driver is? It's a new kind of taxi is what it is. And he'd start driving for Uber, and he was called uh, his first day to pick up a man. He went and picked the man up, and uh, they got headed down the road toward the destination, and the man in the back seat uh, uh, thought of a question he wanted to ask, and he just kind of calmly uh, reached up, and he tapped uh, the Uber driver on the shoulder, and when he did, the driver screamed. He lost complete control, shot across two lanes of traffic, barely missing uh, two other vehicles, popped a curve, and slid finally and stopped in front of a big storefront. And for a moment, as you can imagine, nobody said a word. They were trying to catch their breath. And then the shaking uh, driver turned to the back and said, are you okay? He said, I, I'm so sorry, but when you tapped me on the shoulder, it scared the daylights out of me. And uh, the badly shaken passenger said, no, I apologize. I, I shouldn't have distracted you. I shouldn't have done that. I didn't realize that a mere tap on the shoulder 
would startle someone so badly. The driver insisted, he said, no, no, he said, uh, I'm the one who is sorry. It's entirely my fault. You see, today is my first, very first day driving an Uber taxi. For the past 25 years, I've been driving a hearse. <laughs> well, I don't know what scares you or produces fear in you, but all of us find ourselves fearful in certain seasons of life, right? And David acknowledges that he had battled fear. The very fact that he mentions this means he had battled fear. In his case, fear of others, fear of the enemies. You know, the psalm would also give us this wonderful verse. It says, the fear of man is a snare, or the Proverbs, I should say. The fear of man is a snare. And David battled uh, his fear. And in, in his case, it was the fear of his enemies, the people around him. But he also acknowledges his victory over his fear. And he acknowledges, he tells us in that first uh, verse he tells us really how he had victory over his fear. And I want to tell you how he did that. There were three things that gave him victory over his fears. And I like what he does. He starts out by talking about his victory, not his fear. Did you notice that? He starts this passage off with this great affirmation, God is my light. God is my light. And uh, that's one of the ways he conquered his fear. Uh, he recognized that God was the source of his inspiration and God was the source of his illumination so it didn't matter what others might say. And you know what I love? I love the personal nature of it. Did you notice that? It's very personal. He doesn't say God is your. He says God is my. This is a personal psalm. God is my light. You know, the Bible refers to God as light for his people in several different places. For example, in Exodus 13, 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night, listen to this, in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they may travel by day and by night. You know, when we're in a season of conflict, it's hard to know how to travel, isn't it? It's hard. David's case, he, was, uh, he, he feared the enemy attacking him at any moment. And this was personal. It wasn't just like this is an army because David wasn't the commander. It was personal. My enemies are looking for a way, he said, to take me down. They're looking for a way to destroy me. But he says, my victory is in the fact that God is my light. God will show me the way. God will show me how I should navigate this season. And that's why, that's why we have to have the light of God in the season of conflict. You see, fear can defeat us. Most fears are the result of facing the unknown, aren't they? We just don't know. We just don't know. In the darkness, we can't see, and so we need light. But when we understand that God is our light and His presence and His Word will guide us, we can conquer the fears uh, that we face in the seasons of our conflict because we have the assurance that He will lead us and show us the path. But not only does He say, God is my light, notice He also says, God is my salvation. God is my salvation. He is our light. He is our salvation in the season of conflict. The word salvation uh, here in the Hebrew means to be rescued. We just sang about rescue. And that's what this word means. It means to be rescued. It means to be liberated. David did not have to fear his enemies because God had made a covenant with him. And David knew that the Lord would be faithful to his word. God has told me. God has given me a word, and that word is about my deliverance. David believed the promises of God over the threats of men. And David understood that the purpose of God would not fail. And so David knew he could trust in the promise that God had given to him. He knew that God was his rescuer. God was his deliverer. But there's a third thing he acknowledges as well, and that is, do you see this? At the end of verse 1, the Lord is the stronghold, here it is again, personal, of my life. God is our light. 
He directs us. God is our deliverer. He is the one that takes us through. Uh, God is our stronghold. It means that God is our protector. David did uh, not have to live by fear because he knew that God was watching over him. David was not saying that God was his source of personal strength, though he was. What he's saying here is that God is a fortress for me. It's more than just God being my personal source of strength. He's saying this is about God being a fortress around me. God is a shelter to me. And by the way, it is a theme that David refers to often in the Psalms, that God is my shelter and God is my protector. Alexander McLaren said, only he who can say the Lord is the strength of my life can say, of whom then shall I be afraid? And like David, we must know that as long as we trust in the Lord, we are safe within the impenetrable walls of God's mighty care. And that is true for us. It was true for David. Regardless of the season of conflict, God wants to be your refuge. And so he, the psalmist goes on in Psalm 46 to say this, God is our refuge and our strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. God is our refuge and our strength. He is a, did you get it? A very present help in time of trouble. It's not a future help. It's not a he helped us in the past, though both of those are true. He says he's a very present help. Right now, in the season of your conflict, he is a very present help. Rick Warren said this, fear is a self-imposed prison that will keep you from becoming what God intends you to be. Thomas Merton said, I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. When you are facing a season of conflict, Keep your heart tuned to God and not to your fears, not to your enemies, not to the unknown. God alone is your personal light. God alone is your personal salvation. And God alone is your personal fortress. He is your protection. The second thing that I want you to see this morning, not only did David have conquered fears, But verse 3 tells us that David also had a confident faith. Look at verse 3. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Note that David's confidence had nothing to do with his circumstances. He said, if a whole army encamp against me, he's He's embellishing this thing. He said, I want you to know how great my confidence is in God. If a whole army were to encamp about me, he said, uh, I wouldn't have to be afraid of that. If a war were to rise up against me, he said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to fear that because my confidence is in God. David's confident faith was the result of the Lord's past faithfulness to him. Did you get that? Why could he be so confident in the season of conflict right now? And why can you be confident if you're in a season of conflict? And by the way, you know, I've told you this for 18 years. If you're not in a season of conflict, hang on, you're headed into one. Or you're just coming out of one. But so why can you be confident? You can be confident in the present conflict because of God's past history with you. And the God that David is talking about here of whom his confidence is in had previously given him victory over the lion. You remember? As a young boy in the fields, victory over a lion. Did you know God had also given him victory over the bear and then over the bully? You know, Goliath. God gave him victory. He had all of these things of which he could say, God has brought me through there. God will be a help to me now and take me through tomorrow. What incredible truth 
to remember what God, look, you're here today. Do you, you think about this? Some of you are here, you're in the storm. Some of you are headed into a conflict. Some of you are coming out, but think about this. You are here. And that means God's got you here. That means he's brought you through a whole bunch back there, right? Or you wouldn't be here. See, he didn't leave you or forsake you. He brought you through. And you're here today. And because you're here today, that means this. You can look back and say, time after time, after time, after time, God brought me through. God brought me through. Some of those things he brought you through, you never thought you would get through. You you didn't see a way. You were feeling hopeless. And yet, here you are. Yeah, but this storm's harder than any. That's right, maybe it is. But God used all of those storms to get you ready for this one. And this one will get you ready for another one. You see, so that you can go through them. He hadn't forsaken you. He's trying to take you through. All the victories of David's life have been won by the hand of God, not David's hand. So David's confidence was in God, whom he knew was mightier than any armor that dare wage war against him. You know, I go back to the story of David and Goliath. We all know that story. But he's a teenage boy. He comes out to the battlefield, and Goliath is this probably, scholars tell us, maybe nine-foot-tall Philistine. You ever face a giant like that? And uh, David was a shepherd. He wasn't a soldier. He's just come to bring snacks, you might say, to his brothers who are soldiers. And he sees what's going on, and all the Israelites are cowering in fear because Goliath has come out, out and he's intimidated them and said, just send me one. Let's just settle this man to man, mano a mano. Let's do it that way out in the field. You remember the story, don't you? And nobody from Israel would volunteer to go. None of these soldiers, they were good soldiers. They were fighting machines, but none of them would go out and challenge Goliath. And David comes up and he says, what's going on here? And everybody begins to tell him what's going on. He he says, who is this Philistine that he would defy the army of the living God? This is a teenager telling seasoned soldiers, are you kidding me? Why are we afraid of this guy? He's not defying you. He's defying God Almighty. And David said, I'll go fight him. And the king says, you can't without armor. So wear my armor, Saul's armor, and it probably weighed 150 pounds or more, and he put it on David, and David couldn't hardly move, the Bible says. He says, I can't go in this. And he says, I've got all I need. I've got a sling and a bag of rocks. And he went out, and you know the story. And he faced that giant, he stood before the giant, and the giant said, am I a dog? that you would send a child out to fight me? And David looks at him and says, <laughs> today I'm going to kill you and cut your head off with your own sword. And the giant laughed before he died. Because David said, this giant is defying. This conflict is not about, it's not about me. It's not about Israel. It's about the living God and the name of God. Have you ever thought that the conflicts of your life are more than about you? They are about the glory and the name of God Almighty. But we just turn them and say, this is just about me and I can't make it. I can't make it. Of course you can make it. David knew and he said to, the, to, to Saul and all the army, the same God who has delivered me from the paw of the lion and the, the hand of the bear will deliver this, this giant into my hand. So how do we develop a confident faith like David had? Well, let me suggest about three things that will help you develop a confident faith. Number one, we have to remember God's deliverance in the past. We remember, you know, we don't live in the past. Paul even tells us not to live in the past, but there are some things about the past that are important in our present. And that is to look back at the victories that God has brought into your life. We have to remember God, and David did that. And we let it inspire our present predicaments. 
Look, God has brought you to the place where you are through many paths, through many problems, through many difficulties. Don't forget, never forget how God has worked on your behalf in times past. When I recall God's work in my life in the past, you see, I can be confident in the present season of conflict. So uh, remember God's deliverance of the past. But here's another thing if you want to build a confident faith, and that is we must rely on God's promises in the present. That is, we cling to His Word when we cannot comprehend where He is or what He is doing. You know, in the season of conflict, that's the way it feels sometimes, right? I don't know what God is doing. I don't know uh, where God is. People say this sometimes. I feel like when I pray, my prayers bounce off the ceiling. Where is God? I don't feel Him. I don't see Him. I don't sense Him. You keep hanging on to the promises He has given you in His Word. Do you know, in fact, listen to this. God gives us promises to help us hang on and hang in. That's one of the reasons God gives you promises is so you can hold on and you can hang in because sometimes that's what you feel, that, that's all you're doing, just trying to hold on, you know, just trying to hold on, just trying to hang in so that you can make it through the season. That's why God gives you, that's why he gives you promises is so that you don't end up in utter despair. You see, if you don't have a word, if you don't have the promises of God in this book to hang on, and that's why even when you don't see him, and even when you don't sense him, and even when you think he's not hearing, by the way, he's always hearing, and even when you think he isn't, you stay right here. You stay right here. In this book, and Listen to the promises that he will speak to you. One night a house caught on fire and a little boy was stranded on the second floor. The boy was screaming for help and all the boy could see was smoke and flames. He couldn't see anything else, just the smoke and flames. He was at a second story window but he couldn't see anything beyond the smoke and the flames that were coming up. And he was screaming and he could hear, however, his father's voice. His father was telling him, jump, jump jump. And he, uh, the little boy replied back to his dad, but daddy, I don't see you. Daddy, where are you? Daddy, I can't see you. And the dad screamed back to the little boy, jump son, jump son, I can see you. And that's all that matters. We cannot clearly see God sometimes in our seasons of difficulty and trial and conflict, but he sees us. And that's really all that matters. We hear his promises that he gives to us in his word. We hear them in our head, but listen, the power of them comes when we hold them in our hearts. We read them and we hear them. Don't stop there. Don't just say, okay, I, I read it, I read it. Listen, you can, you can stop right here. You can get it in your head, but you know what? Where it has power in the, the season of conflict is when you say, I'm, I'm not just going to hear it. I'm not just going to let it come in. I'm going to hold on to it right here in my heart. And we hold on to those promises when whatever it is around us seems impossible. You see, Jesus said in Luke, what is impossible with man is possible with God. We hold on to promises about things that seem impossible, but it is, all things are possible with Him. So, so we cling to the promises of God. But here's, a, here's a, a, another way, a third way that you can build a confident faith, and that is you have to trust in God's plans for the future. Trusting God's plans for the future. In your season of conflict, you've got to believe and understand that God has plans beyond the, the present and plans beyond the moment. We must not be controlled by the fear of the future. Instead, we must be focused on God's purpose for our life instead of panicking in our circumstances. David knew the promises of God to him, and the promises of God pointed to the future purposes of God for David. I love the verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. I put it in your birthday card. Uh, every time you get a birthday card from me, you're going to see it printed there. Jeremiah 29, 11. God said this to his own people who had just gone into bondage and captivity, a season of conflict that would last them for 70 years. And at the front side of that, that bondage, he, he wrote these words to them. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. 
plans for welfare, not for evil, plans to give you, listen, a future and a hope. What seems like the end sometimes in the circumstances of our life may just be the very beginning of what God has planned for you. But I can promise you this, God has a purpose and God has a plan for your future. Let me ask you something this morning. Do you believe, do you believe that God knows the plans he has for you? Do you believe that? If you do, do this. I, I believe God knows the plan. Uh, even if you don't know what he's up to, you still believe that he has, he has plans for you? Well, David did. The scriptures teach that he does. And the key is that we have to submit to his plans. We have to surrender ourselves to his purposes. You see, our problem with that is that we want him to go ahead and show us all the plan. I'm in a season of conflict right now, God, so if you'll just go ahead and explain uh, what this conflict, this difficulty, this trial, if you'll just go ahead and explain to me all the details of it, then I'll trust you in it. And if you'll just show me, okay, if I've got to go through it, if you'll just show me what's going to happen down here, then okay, that'll help me right now. But God doesn't do that, and he doesn't do that because he's wanting you to learn that he is trustworthy in the moment and that he is working. By the way, I've told you before, that's why God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Time is irrelevant to him. And so he's already in the future, just like the past and the present. So none of that's all that only matters to us. So we say, God, show us. And God says, trust me right now. I know where you're going. I know the plans that I have for you. You see, David, David had a conquered faith. David had a confident faith. And the reason he had the, uh, the conquered fear and the confident faith is because of the last thing I want to show you this morning, and that is because David also knew he had a competent father. You see, that's why he had, he, he had this conquered, uh, conquered fear, because his trust had been put in his father. That's why his faith was confident, because he had seen his father work in the past on his behalf, and he trusted his, the promises of God and the covenant God had made with him in the present. And so because of that, he knew he had a competent father in the season of conflict. Notice what he says in verse 5, For he that is God will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. In 1715, King Louis XIV of France died. He reigned for 72 years. And uh, he gave himself his own nickname, Louis the Great. I'm the great, I'm the greatest. That's what he said. Kind of like Muhammad Ali, you remember? I am the greatest. Well, King Louis started that. Muhammad Ali didn't start that. King Louis XIV of France called himself the great and demanded that everybody call him the great. He was the famed monarch who made the statement, I am the state, meaning I am the government. His court was the most magnificent in Europe, and his funeral was equally spectacular when he died. And as his body lay in state, they had placed him in a golden coffin. And orders had been given for his memorial service for, as he lay in that golden coffin for one large candle to be placed above it and the rest of the uh, cathedral to be darkened so that everybody's eyes were drawn to the golden coffin where... Louis the Great lie. It was hush in the cathedral. And Bishop Maslin stepped up to speak. And as he stepped up to speak, he gently reached over and snuffed out the candle. And then he said, Only God is great. Friend, I want to tell you something. Only God is great. And because He is great, He is more than competent. 
for whatever conflict he's allowed, for whatever, whatever trial or struggle that's going on in your life, God is competent. He is great. There's no substitute for living in his presence. There is no substitute for living under his protection and being directed by him. Many people turn to God only in times of trouble, but not David. David knew that God was the God of all seasons. He was, he is, and he forever will be our all-competent Father. In everything, think, in everything he's competent. He, God never has to take a refresher class on how to get up to speed on being God. No matter what your season, he never gets it wrong. There are no mistakes with God. There's no plan A and plan B. You know, we do that a lot, and, and that makes sense to us in our world. Sometimes that we need a plan B and a, a plan A and a plan B. But God never stands up in heaven and calls the angels together and says to them, All right, boys, that, that plan didn't work. What else you got? God never does that because he is the all-competent father. He is always, forever, competent. But not only is he the all-competent father, he's the all-powerful father. He's omnipotent, we say, more than capable. He is powerful in any and all circumstances and seasons. He is the all-competent Father. He is the all-powerful Father. He is the all-present Father. He's omnipresent, we say. There is nowhere, listen, nowhere or no season that God is not. David even said in the Psalms, he said, where can I go to get away from you? I, there's no, if I go to the highest place, you are there. If I go to the lowest place, you are there. You may think in your time of conflict, I'm here all by myself. I want to tell you something. No, you're not. You choose to handle it by yourself. Now, that's a different matter, but he is there. He is the all-present Father. He's also the all-knowing Father. We say He's omniscient. Nothing about your season escapes Him. He never forgets, and He's never ignorant. He's never taken by surprise. Your season of conflict or turmoil or trial or whatever it may be it doesn't cause God to say, ooh, I didn't see that one coming. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, you've been going through some stuff. I forgot about that. I forgot that never happens. He's the all-knowing Father. I'll tell you what else he is. He's the never-changing Father. We say that means he's immutable. What he was, he still is, and he forever will be. That makes him, listen, relevant for any season. He's immutable. He never changes. We also call him the incomparable Father. You know why? It's because he is beyond our capacity to understand his infinite mind and ways. But we don't understand that, that he can be infinite in his ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, he says, or my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than your thoughts. But at the same time, he's perfectly, relevantly involved in the seasons of your life. What an incredible thing. He's more than competent, and so he's more than capable to get you through the seasons of conflict in your life. Annie Johnson Flint penned a, a wonderful poem. It goes like this. She says, I know not, but God knows. Oh, blessed rest from fear. All my unfolding days to him are plain and clear. Each anxious, anxious, puzzled why from doubt or dread that grows finds answer in this thought, I know not, but he knows. I cannot, but God can. O oh, balm for all my care, the burden that I drop his hand will lift and bear. 
Though eagle pinions tire, I walk where once I ran. This is my strength to know I cannot, but God can. I see not, but God sees. Oh, how all-sufficient His light. My dark and hidden way to Him is always bright. My strained and peering eyes may close in restful ease, and I in peace may sleep, knowing I see not, but He sees. Do you realize that in your life, in the season of conflict? How do you survive the seasons of difficulty and conflict? Well, you live in His presence, and don't let fear control you. You confidently trust His promises. You cling to them. And know He has a future and purpose for you. And then you relax, knowing that God is able and that He is your competent Father. And remember, when you can't see, God can. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, help us like David to have our confident faith in you and you alone, to cling to your promises, to not allow the fears of life to strangle our faith in you. Lord, I pray for any in this place today that are struggling, that again, Father, that these lessons would bolster them and help them to walk on sure ground, the ground of your word. There are some in here, Father, that are trying to handle it all by themselves because they've never surrendered to you. Help them today to give their life, to give their life, their soul to you. Father, would you speak to us in these moments of invitation? In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? I'll be here at the front of the staff. We're going to be here. And I want to invite you to slip out from where you're seated in the balcony or this ground floor. You see, if you've never met Christ, you need to give your life to Christ. That's what changes this whole season of conflict stuff. You've got to have a relationship. It starts there. Remember David kept saying, my, my, my. It was personal. It was a personal relationship. All of us need that. Jesus died for your sin so that you could have a personal relationship with God. You can't fix yourself. Quit trying to fix yourself. Let him be the fixer. Come in. Invite him into your life today. Would you do that? If so, would you slip out, come down, take one of our staff by the hand, say, I'd like to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. You say, is that a little odd? No, it's not odd at all. People do it here all the time. We'd love for you to do that. You may be here and say, I need a church family to belong to, and I want Ridgecrest to be that church family. Would you slip out, come forward, take one of these staff, and say, I'd like to join Ridgecrest. Know the Lord is my Savior. You come on. Come kneel around the altar. That's a powerful place right there. It's a powerful place for your life to pray for others. It's a powerful place for you to, to pray that God will take you through the storm. It's a powerful place if you've got some decision to make. Whatever it may be, come and bend a knee before God. Would you do that? As we sing, choir leads us. Words are on the screen right now. You slip out. Come on. Today we've been talking about how to survive the seasons of conflict in life. All of us face difficulties and trials and struggles, sometimes circumstances that we don't fully understand or what's going on. But God can make sense of those things, and God is the one who can bring us through to victory. But it begins with a personal relationship with Him. And the only way we can have a personal relationship is through Jesus Christ. Right now, where you are, you can receive Christ as your Savior. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you can do that where you are today. You can say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me, for loving me in spite of my sin, for dying for, uh, for all of my sin. And right now, I invite you to come into my life to be my Savior, my Lord, and my Master. I receive the work you did for me on the cross. Now, if you'll call out to Him, He will hear that prayer, and He'll begin this wonderful process of transformation in your life. And we'd love to help you in that new journey, in that new relationship. 
You'll see contact information on the screen in front of you. I hope you'll let us know about your decision to trust Christ today. We'd love to send you some growth material. It's free. There are no strings attached. Just let us know about your decision to follow Christ. We'd love to get that to you. It'll help you begin this wonderful new journey uh, with the Lord Jesus. And then, of course, to all who are watching, perhaps uh, you're looking for a church home or you uh, need a church home, we'd love to have you visit with us here at Ridgecrest. On Sunday mornings, we have two worship uh, services. We have an 815. We call it a, a blended style worship. It has a praise and hymns. It has a choir and orchestra and praise a group. And uh, that might be to your liking. Or perhaps you prefer a more contemporary venue. At 1050, we have our live service. And it is band driven, very casual, very relaxed. In both of those services, I'm going to share the same message. So uh, just come to the, the one that uh, fits the style you most identify with. And we'd love to see you at either of those uh, to worship with us. If you don't have a church home already, you need one. And then be sure to check us out on the web, by the way, www.rbcdothan.org. Uh, there you'll find information about our events that are going on here, about the different ministries of our church. Uh, you can connect with us by podcast and live stream there. And so uh, check that out, as well as messages that are archived and video on demand. So uh, uh, check our website out. And uh, hopefully it'll be helpful to give you information you might be looking for if you're looking for church. And then, of course, like us on all the social media uh, outlets, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We have a presence there. We'd love for you to follow us there. We keep them updated with information about things that are going on and that are helpful to you as a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm so glad you tuned in today. And I hope that the message has been a great encouragement to you. I've enjoyed sharing it with you. I look forward to sharing another message from God's Word next week at this same time. I hope you'll tune in once again. Until then, God bless you.